Welcome to The Cycle. A video game that although may look like Fortnite's sequel, is a completely different experience. As although it is a competitive shooter, and a battle royale, it offers so much more. You and 19 other players drop into a map where you each compete to complete the most PvE related quests, and a limited time frame of 20 minutes. Each quest or contract is unique and offers its own unique set of challenges. But every contract, no matter what, rewards points and money. Contracts ranging from farming natural gas, defending a drone carrier from alien mobs, powering up the local Waffle House, and everyone's favorite, PvP. And the money you earn, you can use to buy yourself better gear. No more relying on luck to get the good stuff. And as time progresses, the skies get darker, and the radioactive storm that is the cycle begins to manifest. If you manage to evacuate the most amount of points, Congratulations! Give yourself a pat on the back. But what's this? You aren't in the you aren't in first place. Don't worry, scrub. You can still evacuate. Just make sure you reach the ship before it leaves you, and you are turned into a radioactive foamy statue. And that's the game. In a basic format, like the developer said in that one trailer, it's a free to play player versus environment versus player first person competitive quest shooter royale. The Cycle is a game developed by Jaeger, a company in Berlin, Germany, who have worked on other games prior, like Jaeger in 2003. I wonder where they got their name. They've also worked on Spec Ops The Line, which is the most famous work. They have also worked on Dreadnought, a sci-fi combat flight simulator that makes you control a space navy, but the game they've been recently been working on, and the one that I'll be talking about today, is The Cycle. The Cycle, from what I can gather, started development around early 2018 and had its first alpha on August 9, 2018. And looking through earlier devlogs and dev streams as well as some of the YouTube videos of the, ga of the game's younger days, you can just see how much the game has changed. From the in-game maps and aesthetics changing for the better as they are now easier to read, crafting being added and then removed, how weapons went from being standard video game guns to weapons that feel, sound, and work, and act like actual weapons. Add more con adding more contracts to the initial six, an entirely new map, a bounty system being removed entirely, a pre-game hub being added where players can hang out instead of just a menu screen, mob and AI changes and enhancements, voices for NPCs getting improved and added, more artwork, in-air inaccuracy being added and then removed, new game modes, ranked, ranked modes, and the best addition, working vehicle lights. Truly the best game of the century. And many, many more changes from, the, from game changers to some quality of life type stuff. And a lot more that I won't mention because reading patch notes and watching old streams and gameplays gets tiring after a while. Look, the game's website, yeah, it's official and has all the stuff and has the most amount of information, but it's very hard to navigate as I somehow went from looking at a page from mid-2019 to mid-2020 and one click. Apart from this, the game has gotten, like all multiplayer games, meta changes. Which are, well, they're meta changes. And gamers don't like when their favorite item that gives them an unfair advantage against other players is subtly not as powerful and much easier to fight against, so everything is much more balanced. Gamers don't like that for some reason. The list goes on and on, and it's clear the game has changed a lot since that first alpha. However, the main premise of the game is still the same. And the community has mostly liked the changes the game has had. It's very interesting seeing how the game has grown and evolved, as you can clearly see the amount of work that devs have done, and how they care about this project that they've decided to approve upon it over and over again. Starting off the game for the first time, you are greeted by a cutscene, giving you some insight into the setting of the game and some of its lore. The cutscene is honest and short, but it sets the tone for the type of game you'll be playing and does a good job for it, especially with the game's wonderful narration and the stunning art used here, which is made much more memorable due to the game's unique art style. Welcome to the cycle. I think you'll fit in here just fine. After that, you are treated to, like most games, to a tutorial that does its job at explaining the basics of how the game works. 
you learn the basics of movement, contract, and gear, all in this one area. After its initialization, you can see the same art style present in the cutscene, just obviously now in 3D, which, as you can see, is used and will be used everywhere in the game. Starting off the tutorial, you're greeted by some alien flora, with cool blue plants that coil up when you get close to them, and other types of flora that look like I can find them outside in real life. There's a waterfall here with a little pond, but unfortunately no water physics, so naturally I have to give it a 1 out of 10. There's a passive mob here that is present in the full game called Leafman. These cute little orange guys are sort of like a big thing in the universe and crouching in front of them makes them like you, visualized by hearts and... They could have not done this and made this guy just a little mob in the world that does nothing but adds flavor to the in-game world, but the fact that, that they coded them to act like this is amazing for lack of better words. I like when do devs do stuff like this as it shows they really do care about the game and its world and for players adds a sense of immersion and adds more love towards the game. The contracts that you do hear in the tutorial are present in the full game. However, the ones you do hear are simplified versions of their full game counterparts. Don't worry about dying by the way. You may have 300 shields, but you have over 2000 health, and that health regenerates fast. So unless you're trying to kill yourself, you won't die here. After finishing your first contract, you are given to the access to the gear store, which will be crucial in the full game. As this, like the narrator says, allows you to buy stronger gear, whether they are weapons or abilities. In the gear store, you are given access to three guns, all of these ranging in prices that you can buy, and three abilities that all have the same price. It's up to you to decide what you want to buy, but usually the higher the price of the weapon, the better it is. Most of the time and the abilities here are all each useful in their own way. After buying what you wanted, you are treated to your next contract, and once you're done with that, the game will introduce you to the pack mechanic, which is only available in one game mode. Spawning a dummy, which is a clone of yourself, that can only look into your soul at all times, and stand still. It can't even take any damage, as it is invincible. The game then teaches you how to use your comm wheel and how to ping, which is good enough to get the job done, but nothing extraordinary, it's not Apex Legends level of pinging mechanics. And then you are treated to, to your last contract, which is clearing evac and how to evacuate. During this evac thing, your dummy just stays there, doing nothing, staring at you like a child at an airplane. You can use this to your advantage as mobs that spawn during this phase will target it and attack it, and you can pick them off one by one. And once the evac ship lands, you can evacuate and finish. And that's the basics of the game. It doesn't explain it all here, but it gets the important parts done. But did you pay attention to your surroundings during the tutorial? Of course you didn't, as you just wanted to play the game and start shooting children as fast as possible and ignore the beautiful art that devs and artists have done. You are part of the ignorant masses that cause the society to never improve. Shame on you. The tutorial area gives the animated cutscene more credibility, as you can see that this place was once a prosperous world that was ravaged by a storm, with houses and vehicles left abandoned and overgrown. Looking at the sky, you can even see the station and a broken moon, all in a very, very watercolor-like art style that is present all over the game. I want to say that the game looks like Fortnite. However, after looking at the two side by side, I can safely say that the art style brought by Jaeger's Yuri Maizurkin makes the game look more hand-drawn, and somewhat more, uh, mature, if that makes any sense. I'm sorry, I, I don't know what I'm saying. Whereas Fortnite, well, it's it's made to make the 12-year-olds buy the exaggerated swagger of Chun-Li's thighs or Kratos' crotch. Fun fact, this little area in the tutorial is not actually in the full map. This means that Yeager made this little area for only the tutorial besides taking place in the Bright Sands map. Perhaps to Genie's instead, you did well here in the tutorial. Very well designed. Once you complete the tutorial, you are introduced to Prospect Station, the Destiny Tower-like pre-game hub area for the game. This area will act as your lobby while waiting to join a match, but it's also an area where you can get story missions, buy weapons and gear, and even make some friends. This area is very well done in my opinion, as there's a lot of cool details and hidden secrets hidden all over the place. 
Looking around and especially up, you can see just how big the entire station actually is. And you can see little moving lights, which I assume are vehicles and other buildings. And although it's all just a backdrop and unexplorable, it's pretty cool, as I'm reminded of when I played Halo for the first time. In the station, there are a few buildings you can explore, like the arrivals area, which, if you play close attention, there's a room which could be where the simulation tutorials take place. There is a little area next to this called the foaming, where you can see some people who have been foamed being sprayed by some liquid, which I'm guessing frees them from their foaming shell. There is even some NPCs in the terminals, however, you can only see into this place and not really visit it. There's a bar here called the Lucky Leafman, which has some of the best music in the current game. Here you can pick up story missions that give you certain challenges you can do on the surface. Each story quest gives you XP for this game's battle pass system, and in, the, and in some missions, even give you skins for weapons of a specific faction. There are also some nice details in this place, like this little holographic dancing robot. Interact with it and it changes its pose and the dance. And in the back, there is the average English pub drinker. Leaving this area above the bar, you can make out another area called Fortuna's Favor. You can see signs pointing to the area, and you can see the interior from certain angles, but it's visibly empty. And there even is a visible wall that prevents you from going there. This might all be useless now, but I think it might be useful in the future of the game. Then there's Windfall Shop. I thought this was where you get the weapons in the game for the first time I played, but just like all the free-to-play games out there, this is the area where you bring out your IRL wallet. Uh, don't worry, all the items here are cosmetic only. And that's the only stuff you can purchase with real money. You can buy skins, prospect archetypes, rides, and weapon skins. It's entirely up to you to decide what you want to buy, and if this is where you want to spend your money. But, come on, you wouldn't do that, would you? Next to Windfall Shop is the Fortuna Pass, the store where you can check out your progress in the Battle Pass system for the game, as well as giving you your daily, weekly, and seasonal challenges, which reward you XP for the Battle Pass. Challenges are, are rated in difficulty and are very clear to the player what you need to do or where you need to be in order to get your points most of the time. Looking through the Battle Pass, you do get some pretty decent free items that, that are good enough, but if you want the truly good looking stuff, like most games, you gotta bring out your wallet. Just remember that all of this cosmetic and does not affect your gameplay in any way or form. It just lets players know whether or not you pay to look good. There's a shop that looks to be a crafting area that says facility closed. However, you can interact and jump over the place just like the rest of the map. And like Fortuna's favored, I think this place will be useful during the future of this game, but serve no current purpose. In front of that is the mail area. You go here if you got mail, with friendly robots waiting to be of service here. Around this area, there is even a Discord icon that takes you to the game's official Discord server. Also in this station are each of the faction's shops, ICA, Osiris, and Korolev, each with their own unique theme song playing in each shop, as well as with a few details in here, like how Osiris has plants all around them, and even has some leafmen in their habitat ceiling. Like how there's a decorative drone carrier just outside of- Or how ICA has three employees that don't do anything. Especially this one that is looking at a blank screen. Korolev has a blue screen monitor and some statues that show the fate of most people under capitalism. As well as a window showcasing their laser drill. Each of the faction shops has some very nice details and some very nice music. You can also see here what you can buy from each. I will talk more in depth about the factions later and what you can buy from them. Apart from all that, there's also this giant hologram which shows the current rank winners and your placement in the rank system. And finally, there's the launch terminal, where you get to choose how you're going to play or if you're going to be using a simulation. And in front of this launch terminal, there is a clear window where you can see them, as well as Fortuna 3 in its entirety, and the cycle storm raging down below. Around the station are these little vending machine type things where you can check your loadout and adjust it to your liking. And that's the entirety of Prospect Station. There's some nice hidden secrets, like add wanted posters with the developer's faces, and one poster even referencing the game satisfactory. There's also NPCs sitting around doing nothing but doing idle animations. 
in case you're wondering, the station does change during seasonal events, like during Halloween and Christmas time. But other than that, it remains static. However, a major issue I have with the station is that by just pressing the quick menu key, you miss out on all the glory of the station, as you can access this anywhere at any time. You can just click a button and boom, you can buy stuff from factions, start a game, change your loadout, check your mail, and even change your appearance. Which is good and all, but you miss out on people exploring the, the station all by themselves. And it doesn't help that when you unlock new stuff, the game tells you to open the quick menu. That's all I have to say about Prospect Station. The starting gear you get is limited. Going into your loadout for the first time, you realize that the tutorial weapons and gear are not the ones you actually get, as the only pistol you have is the basic K28 pistol, and you only have access to five other weapons. The S576 PDW SMG, which is your standard SMG, which if you want, you can swap up for your other 200 credit weapon, the B9 trench gun, which is your standard six shot pump action shotgun the AR-55 uh, basic assault rifle and the C-32 bolt action, a uh, five shot sniper rifle, and last but not least, your most expensive weapon, the 800 credit FF-4 detonator, a four shot grenade launcher. Besides your weapons, you only have two abilities, which are the heavy turret, which is a nice deployable that deals damage to any hostile nearby, both players and mobs. You also get the cloaking device, which temporarily makes you invisible for a short amount of time while activated. You also see your ride here, which is your bike. You're also given suits. Your suits become stronger the longer you stay alive on the surface, and are your main source of health and shields and mobility. Naturally, you are given the dragonfly suit, which gives you a jetpack you can use, and a slam attack that does over 500 damage, which can be activated while pressing the melee key in the air. The boxer suit, which gives you a charge jump by holding the jump key, it takes you up very quickly, but the charge up can be a turn off for some. Other than that, it has its charge punch ability. By holding melee, you get to do a punch that can do over 250 damage. Pairing this up with the jump, and you can do some insane mobility. The Oni Quick Suit, which has less health than the other suits, but in turn makes you move faster. You can slide jump with this, which you can gain momentum, double jump, and even dodge by holding or pressing, shift, and double tapping any of the movement keys. You can dodge to your left, right, or even behind you. And as you level up during matches, which you gain from gaining XP from killing mobs and completing contracts, your suit levels up, which can lead to a stuff like lower cooldowns for your suit's abilities, damage resistance towards mobs, and even more damage in general in some suits. Everything in your loadout besides your abilities and rides can be modified, as there are basic mods like more damage to mobs or players, different scopes for your weapon, but however there are also more more game-changing mods. Remember the Quake 28 and how it's a basic semi-automatic pistol? Well, with this mod, it can now go full auto, at the cost of some damage and stability, or piercing rounds for the Serie 32 bolt action. Normally, you have to quick scope and kill everything one by one, but with piercing rounds, you can now shoot through mobs, making crowd clearing possible at the cost of some of the weapon's damage. The way you mod your weapons and gear is entirely up to you. Modding is very essential towards your gameplay, especially once you put enough time into it. As you can see, there are three factions or corporations, uh, each with their own unique face attached who you can choose to work with. And as you work more and more for them, you will level up your reputation with them, which will allow you access to more of their gear, which you can then use for yourself. Which, at first, may all seem like your typical friendly weapon and ability vendors, but all you have to do is drop into the planet once and see what I mean. Ah, uh, I think we need more minerals this time, Prospector. Look around. And to be fair, you do get rewarded at the end of the match by leveling up your reputation with them and sometimes even unlocking new gear. And some are friendlier than others, but all you have to do is progress on any contract and you'll hear Hunt contract completed. I still see mutant creatures in the area, Prospector. Get us more samples. And that's all the types of interactions you can have with the factions. Besides going up to the station and being treated to a menu where you can buy faction gear, limited to reputation of course. But what? Did you expect a Fallout New Vegas level of faction interactant system on a free to play multiplayer game? Keep dreaming kid, as factions are mostly your weapon and ability vendors, but hey, they do offer some passive aggressive encouragement. Let me give you a quick rundown on each and 
what their arsenal looks like. I see, eh? This corporation is for the people. And who are the people? That's right. You and me both, friend. And ICA is our friend, as they like using the beautiful as their wood from Fortuna 3. Just don't ask if this has any negative effects on the environment. All of their gear is focused on being balanced as well as being versatile. ICA has you covered with their signature two-shot shotgun pistol, the Bulldog, which like all of their guns is mediocre, but good in the right hands. Their only 200 weapon, the Lacerator, is a weapon that hasn't aged too well. The Advocate, a very good AR with very little recoil. The Voltic Root, a powerful SMG that all the veterans love to use. The Shatter Gun, a lever-action shotgun that decimates anything in close proximity. The Kinetic Arbiter, a very powerful sniper rifle that you won't find anywhere else. And of course, the Haze, which looks like it came straight out of Halo with its purple bubble projectiles. Or the ICA Guarantee, a powerful LMG which guarantees it will shoot your problems away. ICA also has a gadget called the Recall Teleporter, which can be placed down almost anywhere and using it teleports you to where you placed it down. They also have abilities for sale, which consists of the Snare Trap, the most useless ability in the game, an, impenetr an impenetrable dome shield, which you can't shoot out of or towards as it negates all damage, but as well as an aura that heals anyone nearby. Overall, ICA has a pretty good arsenal and some pretty decent stuff for sale. Osiris is a faction that says it's for science. However, just like Elon Musk, you can tell they have other plans. Which may or may not be corporate espionage. Their arsenal consists of precision and expertise-based weapons, which is just a nice way of saying experimental science-based gear that is very brutal. The Scarab, which is their signature burst pistol, which is outclassed by every other pistol in the game, but still decent. The Gorgon, a burst hitscan laser gun, which uses the latest laser technology from my microwave. The ASP Flèche, a very good SMG which shoots very small needles, which will annihilate mostly everything in your path. Of the Basilisk, a very good sniper rifle which shoots fast and has very little bullet drop. The Manticore, dubbed the King of ARs, a very good flechette based projectile AR. And the Phasic Lancer, which is your basic battle rifle. Nothing more is needed to be said about it. The Zeus Beam, which is basically a bigger, stronger Gorgon, except it's more of a laser LMG. The Kepper Revitalizer, which can be used as an inhaler to heal you, but can also be fired in a steady beam that heals anything from your teammates to your deployables, which includes some abilities and even your ride. Their abilities consist of many things, like a very precise but high damage dealing orbital strike, a directional warp, which is basically a blink teleport, a healing device that stays stationary once placed but heals anyone in its radius, and an impenetrable protective shell, which surrounds you and protects you from all types of damage for a brief period of time. Then, there is Korolev, who, if their statues in their shop didn't give it off enough, these guys do anything for wealth and power. Korolev, my comrade, is the best faction. You can tell from the Russian techno in the shop, or the cool armor the paladins get to wear. Their arsenal, as their gear is focused on keeping you in the fight longer than anyone else, as well as doing a lot of damage. The pistol is the properly named the hammer, which, as its name suggests, hits very hard. Their 200 weapons consist of the Core 47, an assault rifle that's actually pretty good. The Scrapper, an SMG that has the highest DPS in the game, as well as the strangest reload animation, and at times looks like a mining tool. Their 500 weapons are the properly named Comrade, a rocket launcher that has seen better days in the game's past, but is still a decent weapon, which solidifies by its name that this is the Russian faction. All they need now is a weapon called the Sickle and its game of the year potential. The KBR Longshot, a battle rifle that is decent but falls short compared to the other battle rifles or snipers in this, of the same price, and the Maelstrom, which is a pretty good shotgun, as the Carla is a portable handheld artillery howitzer cannon, or the very OP Karma, a very powerful Gauss sniper rifle that can almost one-shot anything. They also have abilities for sale, which are a cloak but you're harder to see if you're moving, a barrier that blocks incoming damage but you can shoot out of, an orbital strike, and that's all the factions and what they each have to sell. 
You can play the game by either bringing up the quick menu and clicking play or going to the station terminal and interacting with it. Here you are met with a few ways to play. Solo, which is the basic way of playing, and the tentist in my opinion. Here making a pact is allowed. Remember that tutorial lesson? Well, if you want a pact, solo is the only game mode that allows it. If you choose solo, you'll be dropping in along with 19 other players, and it's up to you to decide how you will treat them. Just remember that they too are thinking the same thing. The other game mode is squads and duo, which can be played with other people. You can finally play with friends, or with random. Both game modes are very similar, however with squads and duos, your, your money is divided by how many squad members you have, so money making is a bit limited in these modes. There is also a ranked game mode, which is self-explanatory. The only difference ranked has than normal is that there's no recall batteries, making it a bit more harder. And if you come during certain times, there are even limited time events, like King of the Zeal, which makes the Zeal contract much more interesting, as now Zeal has variants, each with their own unique quirks, like how carrying one can make you move faster than normal, or how one hurts the player by holding it but rewards more BP than any, than any of the others. Nightfall, which, which makes the game go into dark mode, where the sky is visibly black and everyone has flashlights, which lets you see enemies through walls, which is a pretty fun game mode in a very painful way. Only masochists like this game mode. Showdown makes two teams of 10 compete to get the most amount of points while all uplinks are active at the same time, so both teams fight for their control. It's basically a big game of King of the Hill. Or Overdrive, which is the best squad and best mode in general to come, at, to, come to the game, as it introduces low gravity, fast movement speed, and, every, and everyone is using the same suit, which makes dealing more damage easier while at the same time taking more damage from others. Besides these game modes, there is training modes, where you can learn how to be good at the game. These can be activated and used while you queue up for a match or as a standalone experience. First as a self-explanatory tutorial. Next is the training match, which, like the tutorial, is a simulation where you learn the basics of the game. However, this time, the whole first map is available, with a few contracts which are randomly generated. You spawn here with your current loadout and no money, like a regular match. So you can practice learning the layout of the Bright Town's map, knowing where things like mobs or contracts spawn and how to do them, as your personal AI will tell you a detailed description of each contract, how you encounter works, and how to complete them, as well as some tips about what actually happens during a match, and how to deal with them, all with the safety of no other players bothering you. Or how the training match lasts as long as an actual match, which is 20 minutes. Besides all of this, I think training matches are very well done, although a bit buggy. Besides the training match, there is a pretty good shooting range. In this simulation, you are teleported to a room where marked terminals take you to an area with a contract. Besides contracts and behind your spawn, there is a terminal that spawns a robot that can shoot at you, but none of its bullets will reach you. That is, until you jump the barrier like that one kid in the 2016 Cincinnati Zoo that caused the death of a famous gorilla. Here, you can practice your aim if you want to, but there is a barrier area for that. As to the left area of your spawn, there is a lone terminal that, perts, that teleports you to the actual shooting range. Here are all the weapons of the game and their bare bones, non modded, non skinned versions at least. And you're free to try them out, out with some abilities and gadgets here as well. There are two targets, and the weapons are located on how far they usually hit the target, as shotguns and pistols and SMGs are located close to the targets while snipers are located in very back. There's also a hangar of sorts with a drone with a target painted onto it, and a terminal. Interacting with said terminal and the drone begins to move around the hangar. You can practice your aim here as the drone will record the damage you do to it in a, on a screen and do so for 10 seconds. This is a good area that shows you the weapons and some of the abilities you can unlock, as well as a simplified version of how contracts are and how to complete them. If you're going to be playing the game, you'll be dropped on one of the two maps available. Let me give you a little rundown of each to familiarize yourself with the wonderful world of 14-3 and even give you some helpful tips. Bright Sands is the first and the default map of the game. You can easily tell you dropped here by the reddish brown sands found at the bottom of the map. There are certain landmarks and points of interest named in the minimap that you can spot uh, by walking or running around that can help know where you're located. Bright Sands has a very diverse environment, from a very thick jungle with a crashed ship, where you can't tell if what you saw was a moving person or a falling leaf, a very rocky and sanding area where mineral veins are likely to spawn, an abandoned science campus that never finished building, 
There's some nice waterfalls in the northeast, and abandoned relays around the map. One even has an, o an overgrown satellite. Or how the center of the map is just one giant building, where you can enter from almost anywhere. There's so much stuff in the center that you don't know if people are hiding just around the corner or in the shadows. Looking up to the sky, you can even see Prospect Station and Fortuna 3 would add to the atmosphere. Done even more so with the beautiful art style present all over the game. Crescent Falls is the second and bigger map. You can tell you dropped here due to the broken ring-like object in the center. This map is bigger and in my opinion, better than Bright Sands. As there's more room to run around in and just do stuff in general. This map is much more vertical and in the center there's a ruined city with a bar and a garage. With a river leading to salt flats where geysers. A huge jungle where the trees go higher than you can see. And there's desert with rocks with jade interiors and a nice oasis. This map is just... In the maps and in some contracts you have the chance to run into the creatures of Fortuna 3. Each looks, sounds, and acts different, which makes the world of Fortuna 3 feel more alive. Dirt Beasts are the only hostile biological mobs in the game. They can spawn around the map or during contracts. You will always see these guys emerge from the ground. Killing these guys rewards cash, so if you see any of these, remember that these guys just want to kill you and are not your friends. Here are the Dirt Beasts. Grublings. These small maroon beasts attack head-on, running up to you and swinging their arms. The damage may not look like much, but a bunch of them can be a problem. Good thing is that they are small and can be taken down very easily, usually taking a few shots from any pistol or any weapon at all, or just two melee hits. Second are the Ravagers. These lime green mobs are sort of like the Grubbling. They attack head-on and do have swinging attacks. However, they usually just spit three toxic projectiles in a shotgun-like pattern. A good way to avoid these guys' attacks is to slide or walk behind them during their spit attack. These guys are a bit harder to take down, but you can manage them if you're quick enough. Last is the spitters. These guys are beige with blue, and as the name suggests, they are the ranged enemy. They spit blue energy-based projectiles straight at you or can throw them in an arch if there are obstacles in the way. These three are, are the basic three dirt beasts. However, they aren't the only ones, as there are stronger, more powerful ones that spawn in tougher challenges. This guy is the same size as the Ravager, but acts like a more powerful spitter. This is the Stinger. They are purple and have a very powerful charge up range attack that can hit very hard if you don't watch out. Then there's the Brute. The Brute has a lot of health, and does a lot of damage, with the chance to send you flying with knockback 3. They also have a jump attack and, well, let's just say, don't be anywhere near its landing area. Then there's the Warden. This guy is sort of like the Brute, except he is more range focused, mostly attacking by spitting energy balls at you. These do a lot of damage if they hit you, and can also stay on the ground like landmines. They do detonate after a while after landing, so watch out. Then there's the Howler. Not only does it fly, with its weak spot on its belly, so it's really hard to fight it, but this piece of crap heals and buffs all nearby mobs, and as if that weren't bad enough, it can hump the ground, which somehow cause more mobs to join the battle. And these are the creatures of Fortuna 3. Whatever the mode you choose, unless it's a training simulation, you will have to wait for a match, and once you get... Once you get into a match... Once... Once you get into a match, you are taken to a room where you and other players can fool around for about one minute. This place is the pre-match lobby, where you can see who you're up against, what skins they are using, as well as everyone's drop pods. There's a giant billboard here where you can see who you're up against, where you can see their name, as well as their prospector level, which is just a big marker on how much time they've dedicated to the game. Besides the billboard, there are two giant holograms, and sometimes you might be the one being projected. I'm guessing whoever has chosen to be a hologram is completely random, as well as the title underneath their name. Another hologram in this room is the map in the center, which shows the map you will drop in, which will either be Bright Sands or Crescent Falls. There are also windows that show Fortuna 3 with the cycle raging below, and how you're going to be dropped into the eye of the storm, which... It's quite something to take in. 
Eventually, the last 10 seconds arrive, and the drop pods hatches open. Batam gives the final warnings as alarms blare. You don't have to go to your pods during this, as you're immediately just teleported to the map once the timer ends. But does this area, its ambience, as well as Batam's warnings and tips, while seeing everyone do their own thing, either dancing or just messing around, while we all wait to drop is quite an experience. Which is something I really wish I can relive all over again for the first time. Once you drop into the planet, the game truly begins. You and other players will have a limited time of 20 minutes to complete as many contracts as you possibly can. Each contract gives you BP or victory points and some cash. As you complete contracts, it will increase in demand and so will the reward. And as you get cash, you can buy yourself better weapons and abilities. Do note that the gear store will only show off the things currently in your loadout. Buying stronger gear can make completing contracts much easier as everyone in the match starts with the, starts off with the pistol currently in the world. So in order to get better gear, you and everyone else in the match are forced to make money by either killing mobs, or finding it out in the maps, or completing contracts. It's an interesting way of getting gear as you don't have to look around the map for gear like in most battle royale type games, but instead work for it. Did you know you can upgrade your weapons? Open up your gear store after you purchase a weapon or a ability and you can upgrade it for 150 cash. You can also reorganize your weapons and abilities you have equipped. You can even drop items and cash if you wanted to. And as you do stuff during the match, your suit will level up. I talked about this earlier, but I wanted to remind you just in case you forgot. Because you can get some pretty good buffs out of it. Contracts are varied and unique in playstyle, and you can find them almost anywhere. But the most rewarding ones being placed far away from each other, which will make you travel either a lot by foot, or if you have enough money, by bike. You can sprint forever in case you're wondering, so you don't have to worry about stamina. There is sliding, which you can use to slide anywhere you look, but the speed is consistent no matter what, meaning you cannot use hills to gain speed, but you can spam slide, which speaks for itself. There are more mobility options, but that also depends on the suit you're using and the abilities you have equipped, so I hope you remember what I said about this. Let's talk about the game's combat. Combat is good. Eager did well by making weapons and abilities not only feel good to use, but also balanced enough for, for you to use anything you want. Attacking AI feels great and rewarding, although at times a bit of a bullet sponge. But after a few drops you know how they act and their weaknesses. AR is smart, but it can also be pretty dumb at times, which makes the PvE part of the game fun, but it gets pretty shallow and stale after a while. Be aware that although most contracts are PvE based, the possibilities of running into a player are high, as many will go for high reward contracts, or some like to specifically hunt other players. And this is where the PvP side of the game comes into play. Attacking other players is where stuff gets interesting, as PvP is always unpredictable. But because the cycle isn't your typical battle royale, you can team up with others in a way. The game's way of teaming is called packing, if you are in solos, of course. You can offer a pack to anybody, and although you can only pack with one person, this is available to everyone in the match. Packing removes shields for those who packed it, but at the benefits of two sets of eyes and two sets of guns. It's a fair way of making a solo player stand a chance against a team of two, and for those who wish to work with others, to do so as well. In case you do take damage, because it's inevitable, don't worry about finding health items, because you will recharge your shields and health over time. And although both charge separately, you can always tell how long you have left to recharge if you look at the left side of your health bar. And if the off chance that you underestimate the AI or got attacked by another player, don't worry, there's still a chance for your life. As when you lose your health and shields, you will be in a down but not out phase, where you can slowly move around for a while. And if you survive long enough, you can get right back into the action. If you have teammates, they can obviously pick you back up much quicker. But at any given moment, you can always recall. Whenever you are down, of course. And once you recall, you will be teleported right back to your drop pod, without your recall battery. Which basically allows you to have infinite second chances. If you want more second chances, you will have to pick up your battery. Which will be where you die, or where you drop it. But if you think it's not worth your trouble, be aware that once you are killed again, it's officially game over. As the match progresses, 
you will see the skies above you get more and more cloudy and dark as the cycle storm approaches. And eventually, a ship begins to circle the evac area and the best music currently in the game begins to play. As if you wait too long and not evacuate, anyone else still on the planet will succumb to the radiation of the cycle and will get an immediate game over. And that's the game. Drop into the planet, do PV related quests to earn points and money, use money to buy yourself better gear to do more contracts to get more points, all while watching out for PvP. And evacuate at the end of the match. If you manage to evacuate with the most amount of points, you win. With a lot of XP and K marks, which is the game's currency, then everyone else in the match, which you can then use to buy abilities, weapons, and mods in the station. However, do know that anyone can evacuate, even if you are in last place. And maybe the evacuation in itself is a win in its own way. I really like this and props to Jaeger for creating such a good balance of PvE and PvP to create a very fun, but yet tense experience. Once you're on Fortuna 3, it's up to you to complete contracts within the 20 minutes given to you. The contracts you get in a match are completely up to RNG, however each contract is unique, making you strategize differently for each. At first, all contracts, except for a few, start small, but as you do more of them, their demand and rewards will also increase. This system allows for anyone to do any contract they please. However, if you're looking for big rewards, you will have to do either various contracts in a match or compete against other players for their contracts. Minerals are the most common contract of all and are the contract that is guaranteed to be in every match. Minerals come in veins, which are rated in difficulty, and how much they yield. You start the contract by interacting with the minerals, which will call a drill to start drilling them over time. However, the drilling noise attracts creatures called dirt beasts that will try to actively destroy the drill. The number of creatures and which ones that spawn depend on the mineral vein. However, it is up to you to defend the drill from these creatures. After the drilling is done, it is ready to be collected and you can collect a reward. Be aware that the drill can be destroyed, and if that happens, you will have to restart drilling all over again. Or that after the drill is finished, you will hear a chime and a beacon will display which you can use to tell whether it's finished or not. Be aware that anyone nearby can see that drill beacon. This contract is fairly PvE focused, however it can also attract other players if the vein is large enough. This contract is very valuable through the whole game due to how common it is and that once completed, you not only get BP from completing it, but also money from killing the mobs that the contract spawns. You can also steal minerals from people while they fight off the mobs or other players, which is one of the most satisfying and rewarding things to do. Hunt The hunt contract was also introduced in the tutorial, and the basic premise of it is to hunt mutated versions of mobs. These are stronger versions of their normal counterparts, and to collect their biomass once killed. You can identify the hunt's difficulty based on how many stars are shown on the map. This is also a PvE-focused contract, a thing to note about this contract is that all mutated versions of the creatures still act the same as their normal variants, but instead just have a bit more health, so you don't have to worry about some new movesets or new abilities. A cool detail is that the mutated versions of creatures are white with pink highlights and glowing pink eyes, but most mobs will maintain their very recognizable appearances by their respective glowing colors. There is a bigger, more challenging, and more rewarding version of the Han contract called the Alpha Warding. This contract only appears after a certain amount of bio samples have been collected in the entire match. It's a simple Han contract with a twist. There's only one target, and it's more of a boss fight. This is also a PvE-focused contract, however it is very rewarding and sort of like the Epic Mineral, a high priority contract, which means it draws a lot of attention. Prepare for some human encounters if you dare take on the hunt for the Alpha Warden. You're rewarded BP depending on how much you damage the Alpha Warden, and even more BP if you manage to take it down. The Alpha Warden is basically a Warden with a ton of health and the added attacks of a Brute. Its design is unique and works pretty well, however it has a major problem. It deals a lot of damage and spawns all the biological creatures, which means it can spawn Brutes, Stingers, and yes, Howlers. This is a very tedious contract, as you have to both do damage and avoid the attacks of the Alpha Warden, but also the other creatures it spawns. Also, watch out for enemy prospectors. As I said, high priority contracts are just that, 
and they may either take the kill from you or use the contract to attack others. The tips I have for this contract are to get in the high ground as most attacks from the warden can't reach you and the warden can also get stuck in its spit animation. So you can always use that to advantage. Also, another thing about the high ground is that you can keep tabs on whether or not enemy prospectors are nearby. Power facilities. Around the map there are facilities that will spawn. Each has to be powered up by activating three overgrown terminals that are hidden nearby. However, there's a catch. By activating each terminal, cobots will spawn. These are another NPC enemy that will spawn during a contract and try to stop you from completing it. After you activate all three terminals, you can then power the facility generator. And once that's done, contract completed. If you can't find a terminal, you can bring out your scanner, which will beep louder the closer you are to a terminal. Or you can just look for the white line coming from the generator, which points to the general direction of each terminal. If several facilities have been powered throughout the match, a priority version of the, of the contract will spawn. This is the central station. This will spawn in the center of each map. This facility is a bit different. You still have to find and activate each terminal. However, after you activate the main generator, a designated area will spawn. Which makes you stay in this area to gain points, but be aware that waves of bots will spawn in this area. And because it's a priority contract, expect some competition. Drone Salvage and Launch Drone Salvage and Launch are treated like different contracts in the game, even though they both rely on each other, so I decided to cover them together. After two minutes after the match begins, around the map there will be drones you can salvage. Interacting with them will make them fly towards their carrier, and depending on what condition the drone is, you will be rewarded based on that. Be aware that mobs are attracted to the drones and will try to destroy them, and if a drone is destroyed, there is a penalty. A tip for this contract is to kill the mobs first, then salvage, as the better condition the drones, the more points you get. Then comes the drone launch. If you salvage all the drones, a, me a message will place to signify the drone carrier is ready for launch. If you go to the drone carrier, you are prompted, if you want, to launch it. Doing so starts the drone defend contract. Here you will have to defend the drones as they are exposed during the state before it's launched into space. You will have to defend the drone carrier from waves of creatures that will come to attack it. The challenge here is sort of that of a 600 mineral vein, and the same creatures will probably spawn during this as well. Be aware that any nearby prospectors are given another contract while you defend your drones to sabotage them. Their goal will be to destroy the drones before they launch. Do note that both defending dead drones and sabotaging them both rewards the same amount of EP, and that salvaging drones are their own personal contract, so there are many ways for you to do this contract. I like this contract as it's the perfect balance of PvE and PvP, and overall it's my favorite contract. Mag Train. The newest contract to the game is very hit or miss depending on the person. In a match there will always be two trains. And during the beginning of the match, the trains will stay in their spawn locations, loading their cargo. And if you click your map, you can see this number slowly growing as time passes. After a while, both trains at the same time will be ready to be launched, and Korolev's head will tell you that they are ready to be claimed. Claiming a train will make it begin to move slowly towards the center of the map. You don't have to be at the train at all once you claim it, as it's pretty independent. You get BP on this contract for how long you hold the train during its passage. But be aware that anyone can steal the train from you at any time, as all you need to do is interact with the console of the front of the train. The train will keep going, but now the points go to its new owner. And once the trains reach the center, they will begin to unload their cargo. And here, if you hold the train during this phase, you get three times the amount of BP than normally holding it, so during the unloading phase, trains become a very valuable contract. Uplink This contract is fairly simple. Around the map there are three uplink relays, with only one being active at a time. And throughout the match, they rotate around the map. You can always check which one is currently active and which one will be the next by using your map. This will also tell you how long until the relay switches. You can also look towards the sky, which will tell you which is currently active and which one's next by looking at the colored beacons you can find. Going to the relays and staying in the highlighted area for a certain time, and you will have ownership of the uplink, which will passively give you BP for how long you hold it. Do note that after you claim it, you don't have to stick around and are free to do anything you wish to do. Sort of like the train contract. 
You also get a warning if someone is trying to steal the uplink from you or if the uplink is switching soon. Uplink is a very popular contract as it's very valuable and because each uplink relay has many ways to approach it and also a lot of cover, you can always expect people to come around from any corner. Overall, a very cool contract. I really like this one. Lithium gas. This is a very easy contract. Go to a gas vein which can be found anywhere around the map and interact with it, which will call down a refiner. The refiner will passively collect gas for you, which will passively give you VP over time. Your refiners, as the match progresses, will get better and collect gas much faster. But they can also be stolen or destroyed by any prospectors. If your refiner is being stolen, you'll get a message from your contractor. And if you bring up your map, you can see which refiner is being stolen. This contract is very passive, so don't expect many confrontations here. Zeal the Zeal contract is an interesting one. In the match, two Zeals will spawn. Interacting with one makes you carry it, and as you carry it, you will passively get radiation. I mean VP. You can always drop it whenever you want, or if you take too much damage. It's a good way to get some VP as you do other contracts, as you will have it with you at all times. However, making you visible on everyone else's map as a glowing Zeal moving throughout the map. Overall, I really like this contract as it's a good way to get some good points, but as a side effect of being a visible target to everyone else in a match. And later out through the match, another version of the zeal will spawn. This one is acts the same as a regular zeal, however it's red, and if you evac with it, you get 40 extra points. And it also only spawns during the last moments of the match. So look out for it. Brightcaps. Brightcaps is a PvE focus contract. Around the map there will be areas where these mushrooms will spawn, but beware, ticks spawn here as well. You gain points by collecting these mushrooms and depositing them in the center of the map. Collecting them makes a visual change to you as a canister will be on your back, where your bright caps are stored. Once you deposit them, stay in the designated area as your bright caps are being collected. Ticks will spawn here so you'll have to deal with them appropriately, if you don't want to get hurt of course. Now, you could go around the map to each brightcap hotspot and collect them that way, or you could go hunt other players with brightcaps and either kill them or deal enough damage that they drop their canister in the back, collect said canister, and deposit it. In my opinion, this is a pretty solid contract. Lazy Drew is a contract exclusive to the team-based game modes like duo or squads. Here, a Coral Ev Laser Drill will descend from the skies and go to one of the many drill hotspots in the maps. Once it lands, anyone can claim it, and once claimed, it begins to drill. However, like the minerals contract, here, however, waves will spawn depending on how much time the drill is active. All biological creatures except ticks can spawn during this, and there are a lot of them. Creatures will try to attack the drill and if taken enough damage, will cause a big explosion which can one-shot anyone nearby. And throughout the match, the drill will move from hotspot to hotspot hovering over the entire map, which gives you some good views of the maps from a mostly impossible point of view. A decent contract for money making due to how many mobs it spawns early game, and not much worth elsewhere. Cycle Spike Near the end of the match, there's a chance a Cycle Spike contract may appear. This contract it makes you go to a designated area where the storm is stronger than the rest of the map. Here, lightning falls frequently and sometimes where you stand. In this dangerous area, storm crystals appear. Collecting them in groups gives you BP. This contract is a very high risk high reward, as the lightning does significant damage if you get struck by it, and if you get struck, you also get your location temporarily revealed to everyone. This is a good contract as it's very PvE focused, but if you don't watch out, you can reveal your location to anyone nearby. Clear evac. In the last minutes of the match, the evac ship arrives. However, it cannot land due to hostile creatures that spawn there. And although the ship has guns, it can't exactly do anything but fly. So it's up to you to clear evac. The amount of BP is good enough for some last minute points, and almost any creature can spawn here. So be cautious, but hopefully by this time, you should have better gear. Sometimes the smaller mobs like to hide in very strange locations and because the ship can't land even if one is still alive, but nowhere to be seen, there have been matches and instances where everybody in the match dies due to a mob getting stuck somewhere and nobody finding it and killing it. 
since it's one of the main requirements to evacuate and to clear evac, expect people. Either run for it or fight your way in. Evac. This is self-explanatory. And yes, you actually do get points by evacuating safely. This contract is more valuable in squads, but evacuating even in solos gives you 40 points. Just touch the ship's doors and you should be fine. You can even teleport or warp here if you want, which makes evacuating much easier. PvP. Yes, you get points for PvP. You get points if you manage to either make them use your emergency recall, or completely kill them, or phone them. The reward is 5 BP for, it, for each kill or recall, which may not seem enough, but remember there are other contracts in game, and you can always steal them from unsuspecting players. And if you kill a lot of people, those points add up. Personal Contracts Personal contracts all reward the same amount of BP, but aren't main contracts, so to speak, as they are unmarked and hidden around the maps. But you can't find them. There are only three of them, however. But if you spot one, do complete it if possible, as it's a good amount of BP. Egg Delivery If around the map you hear a high pitch ringing, even if you haven't been next to an explosion, take off your headphones. If this continues, go to a doctor. If the noise is in-game, there's a green egg nearby. Find it, collect it, and deposit it to the location marked in your map, where a crate lies. Once the positive, enjoy your free BP. Tracking. See some purple tracks? Interact with them and follow them to lead you to a nest. Interact with that nest and get some BP. Warning that the nest doesn't spawn until you interact with the footprints. And if someone is nearby where that nest spawns, they can take that. Data download. In some abandoned buildings, some pink terminals may spawn. Collect the data of three terminals and you are good to go. Do note that not all spawn in the same place, but they are very common in a banded building, so keep an eye out or listen for its audio cue. A wise man once said that you can tell a lot about a game's community based off the R34 that comes out of it. The cycle doesn't have any R34. Community. If you've been watching the gameplay, you might have noticed that chat box in the bottom left corner. And since this is a multiplayer game where you can drop in with other players, it means that the game has a community. You can use the in-game chat box to talk to anyone at any time, during the station or during a match. There is also a voice chat that is only available if you pack with someone or play any of the team-based modes. However, you can only talk to your allies. You can also encounter the community through the official Discord, which is where mostly everyone hangs out, and even you have the chance to talk with some of the devs. Like most FPS games, it's a pretty decent community. The game in its Discord does, a good, does have certain rules, which are kind of obvious, and here's a quick rundown of all of them. If you do encounter any form of toxicity, however, please report it to the community managers, as they aim to keep a good community and do a damn good job for it. The community has also made content for the game, whether it be fan art, YouTube videos, or through streaming, or on any other forms of media. A lot of creators have made a name for themselves with the cycle, and these are the types of people that make game communities fun and exciting. A big respect for those of you who have made content for the cycle one way or another. You guys make the community very fun. However, there is a darkness on the horizon. The, the game's community has become divided as to the light of some recent news, as the future of the game lies in the balance. The future of the game. The devs announced that the game was changing completely on September 4, 2020, around the time when Season 3 started. They announced with a stream and a few days later, with their first dev diary giving more explanation into this upcoming rework. The current version of the game is a very competitive and, and in a way, a more of an arcade-like experience, as everyone in a battle royale type game where everyone competes for the highest score. However, the newer version that the dev said will completely replace the current edition of the game and become the new identity is more of an escape from Tarkov or a Hunt Showdown inspired experience, where everything is more tense, more hardcore, and in turn, more high risk, high reward. The devs have already set in stone their decision and the community has acted as you expect. There are some who really like the new change and are, and are looking forward to it. 
while others claim it's the worst decision Jaeger has made for the game. I feel really sad actually, because I feel like what is going to happen to the cycle is going to change into something that already exists. Uh, it's sort of a escape from Tahoe style. And that's not what I thought was going to happen to the cycle. When I start playing the cycle, I look at it as a game that I have never seen before been made. Something that was not called a battle royale, but in sort of also was one. You know, you can everyone can escape the island depending mm -hmm. on how many points they have, and um, and that is a thing I've never seen the game do. And I thought that that's something new. This is going to be the new thing in the future, hundred percent. Like if this game gets out there and gets yelled at, and people hear about it, it's going to be the new thing. The you know better than. Um, Battle Royale games that uh, are currently the most meddling, meddling games at the moment. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm actually quite sad they do they do change it like this because I never I never see that coming actually. So um, my thought about the cycle changing, that's not what I wanted. I think they have a very unique game that just needs to be heard of, and I don't think they should do it. But um, that's just my opinion. I've been living with that cycle for a very, very long time now, uh, ever since it came out. So um, I, I could see something big in it. And that is that is my thought. It's weird to watch a game you love not just change. Like, like to me, the real problem here, and every time I've sort of talked to someone about it, is like it's not the game mode as much as I don't really like Tarkov-esque stuff. The personality has changed. Something's gone. There is a sense of fun that is gone and and a lot of things are contributing to that the tonal shift that's the one that's really getting me like like as much as i'm not a fan of the genre of these like tarkov-esque things it's this idea of the comedy of the cycle and the kind of craziness of it and the big kind of you know western twanging guitars as you're running for your life from a big storm of doom that's all gone and now it's just some guy's gonna headshot me over there and i'm gonna feel salty about it because i lost my inventory management <laughs> and it's a weird difference it's it's a jump and as far as jumps go it's so odd to watch a game that i love lose every sense of its personality in every way it hurts it really hurts because it just doesn't feel it, it it it's got it just it's wearing different boots like it's wearing completely different it's wearing the clothes and the skin of the cycle but it's not the same it's this awkward position because i think when games die there is a desire for preservation the idea of like this game is dead and there will be some weird dedicated community who are reverse engineering the code to play that game again over the course of many years and and there's a passion to that when a game dies there's a weird sad passion that people try and revive it in some way but this is a game updating itself it's paving over the slabs that code will not be something we can preserve it will be gone and that stings because this isn't just a game dying, this is a game being paved over, you know, pave paradise and put up a parking lot. And, yeah, that's, I mean, that's how I feel. <laughs> In a way, I understand the frustration that some players have. A game that they have played for so long is going to be gone for good, and be replaced with a completely different experience. And, especially one that you have followed for two years, as it got better and better over time, and become a very fun take on the battle royale genre, where you have to prioritize managing your time while going for while going for high rewarding contracts, is soon going to be nothing but a thing of the past as the game changes direction. While I was doing research on the cycle, I found a devlog from when the game was first released in its first ever alpha. The devlog named Project DNA. Reading through it and looking at the concept of what the devs had planned since this game's original launch, it sounds a lot like what the devs have planned for the rework that has the community split apart 
and I'm guessing that the devs just couldn't make their idea come to life or just couldn't properly do their project. And around the time the battle royale genre was at its highest peak, so they hopped onto the battle royale trend and launched a game that was fun and unique, but far off of their original vision. And as time went on, games like Hunt Showdown or Escape from Tarkov started to appear and gain popularity. And this, in turn, probably, got the devs to realize that their original idea could work. I recently got the chance to talk with the devs and ask, and ask them the question if Project DNA was the original idea, and if this idea is making its return as the upcoming rework. And this was their response. If this was the devs' original idea, and they are really passionate about it, I'm sure they can create a great game. The Cycle is a game I truly enjoy. I like its formula where it requires mostly PvE contracts in order to win. The chances of PvP are always on your mind as you never know what to expect. I like the contracts and the gameplay looped. I do feel, however, that in some parts of the game it feels empty, or how it has some bugs are kind of annoying, how bullet spongy almost everything is, or how the game after a while gets stale. I do have my complaints about the game, and I do sometimes yell a few not so nice words when I do get ambushed. But in the end, this is just a game where I can take a break from my real life. A game where I spend most of my time in a queue because of the low player base, but I've come to know mostly everyone and met some nice people along the way. The current version of the game might be over soon, but it's some of the most fun I've had in a battle royale type game. I understand why the devs are changing the direction of the game, as the current version is good and fun, but the devs had said over and over that even though it draws people, not many stay, as the game doesn't have much of a replay value to it. Or how the current version has so many things that a lot of new players will just be confused of what to do next. And I can completely understand and support the changes that are coming. I also understand the frustration of those who like the current, who like the current version of the game, seeing a game they love and spend countless of hours and be lost at the time. And that's why I'm making this video, in a way not only to talk about something I love, but to show what this game used to be and how much it has changed in its lifetime. I may not be the best player, nor have I played the longest, but I do like this game enough to make a video about it and talk about it with others. Tuna 3. And for a while, this frontier world was paradise. We mined its vast resources in the shadow of ancient ruins. Then one day, the planet turned against us, with freak storms forcing us to evacuate the colony. Now, only the toughest adventurers dare to set foot on the surface. With the colonies lost, we set up base on Prospect Station, orbiting the deadly planet. It's where we trade, arm ourselves, and gear up for the next drop. It's home. My name's Batam. I run things up here. So, you want to be a prospector. I've seen all types try their luck. Some ended up friends for life. Others, well, they're the more ruthless type, proud of the bounties on their heads. When you drop down to Fortuna 3, you've got to ask yourself, what kind of prospector am I? A glory hunter willing to do whatever it takes for victory. A team player who won't leave anybody behind. Maybe you're here for the bragging rights. Like hunting down a galaxy's deadliest beasts and living to tell the tale. Or you could be the cold-blooded sort, preying upon rival prospectors instead. In the end, Anything goes in the hunt for fame and fortune. Welcome to the cycle. I think you'll fit in here just fine. Okay, thanks if you made it this far. I'm kind of new to all of this, as this is my first ever video that I'm making all by myself, but I would acknowledge some things. One is that I might have missed or not have talked about some things that I wish I have had, but but I forgot about them. 
I'm planning on, once I get some more experience with script writing and editing, to remaster this video with stuff I missed and more content. So if I miss anything or want me to talk about something about the game, please leave it in a co leave it as a comment. Another thing that I will I will mention and acknowledge is that since this is my first super video, I know it won't be perfect. So please leave feedback, as I would really appreciate it, even if it is that my voice sounds like a 13 year old's. Links in the description for stuff that I talked about, uh, as well as content creators of the cycle, as well as Jaeger's official pages and stuff. Uh, that's about it. Thank you for watching this video. Uh, leave feedback. That's about it, however. I'm planning a lot of stuff for the future, so stay tuned.